you're gonna learn everything you need to know to make your perfect bowl of pho. From what bones to use, how to make the noodles from scratch, and the secret technique of tasting as you go. Except, I have a confession to make. I never learned how to make pho. I'm 5,000 miles away from the people who can teach me. So, we're gonna figure this out together. Okay, you hear me now? How's everything, mommy bo? What do you think makes a good bowl of pho? I think so, the, the, the broth. And that's what you guys thought too. There are three main parts of pho. Broth, noodles, and toppings. Do you have a good broth recipe? We never measure anything. Uh, I don't know, I, I measure things like that and I test it, it tastes different so I can have to put more in there. So, <laughs> so how are we gonna make a broth with no recipe. How you make broth with uh, cow bone, vegetables, seasonings, and spices in hot water. You uh, cook it for 12 hours and you test it while you cook it. When you make the broth, what kind of bones do we even use? I use uh, you know the um, what you call the shin bone, the oxtail. I think it's the make it more beefy and the meat. No, the brisket. I thought soup was mostly made out of bones. Why do we use brisket, a meat? So, I looked into it. Turns out, in terms of flavor in broth, meat is the highest quality, then bones, then things like skin at the bottom. Bones are used because they're cheap, and it minimizes food waste. What kind of meat has more flavor? There are two main types of muscle. Dark meat, type one, and white meat. Type 2. In chickens, type 1 muscles are used constantly for standing and walking. The muscles have more fat content for energy, which means more flavor. Type 2 muscles are used only for quick, fast actions, like when chickens flap their wings to fly short distances. The more that an animal uses a muscle, the richer its flavor. That's why parts like cow's legs, chest, or shoulders taste so beefy while less active areas like the tenderloin have less flavor. However, frequently used muscles tend to be tougher. In long cooked dishes though, this toughness softens as collagen converts to gelatin, a process I discussed more in my tonkatsu videos. That's why we use leg bones, oxtail, and brisket. How can I get more flavor out of meats that I already have? Uh, you clean it first, you cook it to clean it. What he means is blanching. Traditionally, in order to get a clear broth, you boil bones for about an hour, dump that dirty broth, and start a new soup. Then skim it again for your final soup. During my research, I found a potentially tastier method using an oven. I compared soup made from blanched bones to oven roasted bones. Surprisingly, the oven roasted bones had a richer flavor and less scum to remove. But why is that? According to On Food and Cooking, when you roast bones in the oven, they turn golden brown, meaning that a Maillard reaction is happening, deepening the flavor. It also coagulates the surface proteins so you don't need to skim the broth as much. Vegetables offer a natural sweetness and aromatic flavor. For our broth, we're using radish, onion, and ginger. And you grill it, you burn it, uh, the outside a little, little bit. Why do we even char our vegetables? I tested it out by comparing soup made with charred vegetables to one without. Whoa, I did not expect that. This one's like, okay, this is a nice comforting bowl of vegetable soup, but this one, it feels like I'm drinking a campfire with my vegetables. That adds a lot of complexity into the dish. Roast your vegetables. For sure, roast the vegetables. Charring adds a smoky flavor into the vegetables and caramelizes it to add depth and complexity to the overall soup. Now that we have our vegetables, spices give pho its distinctive aroma. There are two main ingredients, uh, sardines and uh, cinnamon. If you have something else, you can put it in there. Spices like cloves, cardamom, fennel seeds, coriander seeds. Don't forget about the star anus, guys. We now know that roasting meat enhances flavor. 
So what about spices? I compared soups with toasted spices and untoasted spices and well, Oh. Wow. Toasted, huge difference. This tastes 10 times stronger than this. This smells like it's as a stronger smell, but when I had this, flavor. So much more flavor. Toast your spices. Oh my God. I still wondered how much spice should we use? But after researching, <sighs> so I fucked up. Oh my god. Ah, uh, I burned soup. I have to try that again. God damn it. A better question was, how long should we boil the spices? I boiled spices with different times. One hour, four hour, eight hours, and 12 hours. That's like a light hint of spices. No way. All these three taste like water. One hour tastes like spices. I'm so upset. Spice flavors only kind of stay in the stock if you boil it for one hour. Somewhere after one hour, the spices disappear into the air. So the last hour that you cook your broth, you should put your spices in. <sighs> but I still don't understand what's going on. I couldn't find a lot of reliable sources that explains why toasting brings out the flavor in spices and why flavors tend to disappear after long periods of cooking. If somebody could link me the sources, I'd love to read it. From what I'd gathered, toasting spices increases their aroma, but with exposure from other ingredients like air and heat, these aromas change. Interestingly, using whole spices is better when you cook for a long time. Now that we have an understanding of what goes into the broth, let's Put it all together. Start by roasting the bones in an oven until golden brown. I have to use my friend's oven because I don't have my own. At the same time, roast your vegetables. In a pan, sear the brisket on all sides until brown. In a large pot, add your bones. Pour water over your ingredients, ensuring that they're just covered. Aim for a 1 to 1, maximum 1 to 2 meat to water ratio for optimal flavor extraction. Don't forget your vegetables. We'll save the spices for the last hour. But first, we gotta season our broth. What's your secret ingredient, Bob? Um, that's MHE. These three ingredients will either make or break your pho. And you taste it while you cook it. These are the only things you're really adjusting. We're gonna season twice, in the beginning and at the end of cooking. The broth basically has to carry the whole bowl of flavor. Aim for the broth's saltiness to be just shy of seawater or too salty. Salt actually helps extract the flavor from vegetables and meat. Afterwards, add enough MSG till you feel your cheeks slightly squeeze. Then adjust with sugar to balance out the saltiness. It shouldn't taste noticeably sweet. If you use uh, rock sugar, it's a lot better. It tastes almost like it's caramelized. It's like a little bit nuttier. As the broth simmers, the flavor will change. The vegetable's natural sweetness will emerge, minimizing the need for sugar adjustments. That's good. For exact measurements, check the link below. Who got the broth is clear, you have to Make sure it's no bubble. Water is the about 180 to 200 degrees. High temperatures create vigorous boiling, causing collagen to emulsify or blend into the broth, making it cloudy. Cooking at lower temperatures ensure minimal bubbles, preserving the clarity of the broth. Chicken, also chicken. The rolling boil one or the higher temperature one has a little bit thicker of a mouthfeel. It's like comparing ketchup to water. It's not like this one tastes worse. It's just different mouthfeels. How long are you supposed to boil the pho for? Usually we cook it for like one hour, 13 hours. People cook only like uh, eight hours, but I think it's the more longer you cook, the better, you know, the bone the come out, the, the broth of the bone come out so a lot better. Well, science may vary. My personal preference is one rooted in tradition. For me, 
pho is usually for breakfast, so an overnight cook ranging from 8 to 12 hours ensures the meat becomes perfectly soft and tender. I'm just gonna go with my dad for this one. What's exactly happening while you boil soup? Boiling extracts flavors from the ingredients into the water. As the temperature rises, the cell membranes of ingredients are damaged, causing them to lose water and deflate. Collagen turns into gelatin, meat gets tender, solid fat becomes liquid. This process helps release flavors and nutrients from ingredients into the broth. Heat the water up until you see it boiling, then turn it to the lowest setting. This should keep the water around 185 to 200, ensuring minimal bubbles. Skim off all the brown bits from the broth surface that comes up. Let the broth simmer for eight to 12 hours. The morning after, toast your spices and enclose them into a cheesecloth or a tea strainer. You don't have to do this, it just makes it easier to strain it later. Add the spices. After about one to two hours, taste the broth. Make sure you could smell the spices. At this point, I'm just gonna put salt and MSG. Uh oh. Okay, I think it's there. And then strain the broth. Now that we've got our broth figured out. Hello? Yo, Maylene, did you wanna come over and have some pho? Well, do you know how to make pho noodles from scratch? I, I usually buy 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 it uh, from a uh, store, but no, know it, but I don't. <laughs> I'm so fu after hours of scrolling the internet. <laughs> Every video had some sort of variation. So I think the best pho noodles are elastic and chewy. When you pull on it, you don't want it to snap immediately. You want it to stretch. So when you bite on it, it should feel like you have to bite it a couple times before it breaks apart in your mouth. And cooking it, it was even like more confusing because there were so many different ways of cooking pho. And so I'm just gonna give it a shot. I'm making a batter with rice flour, tapioca starch, salt, and water. In a steamer plate, I spread some oil and poured some batter in. Okay, this is looking a little weird. Okay, that looks pretty weird. Somehow, I'm supposed to take it off that plate. Oh god, this is freaking hot. But oh, this is cool because it's stretchy, but oh my god, this is so hot. Ah! Oh. Ah! <sighs> Oh, that's horrifying. That looks so bad. Texture's very f stretchy. Not bad, let me just try that. I like that chewy texture. All right, I'm gonna try it again. Whoever does this in Vietnam is crazy. Like, this is so hot. Something. I might just try slapping it down onto something. Please, just fall. Ah, nice. I have to do this for all of this? You know, all these videos were like, Oh my God, make pho, it's so easy. It only takes 30 minutes. I've been here for two hours making three sheets of pho. And finally, cut it. It's stretchy, but just really uneven. This isn't gonna be that long either. Yeah, like look how short this noodle is. Imagine getting this in a bowl of pho. Making one set of noodles would take you all day. I feel like this technique is just overall really hard to do and it takes a lot more practice. This method sucked. We can do better. I found a different way. I can use a pasta maker to make pho. This method uses the exact same ingredients with the exception of fresh rice to make a dough that goes into a pasta machine and then boiled. So first, you blend the rice with water. Add tapioca starch, rice flour, and salt. Mix and knead until you get a ball. I'm not sure how this is gonna stand in the pasta maker. Hopefully this works. Please work. Oh my God, it's working. I am so happy right now. Oh my god, look at this. It's a flat sheet, even thickness. Cut the pasta. Oh, they're coming out. Look at that. That's beautiful. 
boil it and then all right let's give it a shot wow this is like way better than the ones that you buy in the package look how elastic this is these are so chewy this is taut stretch it could go almost twice its size. This is so good. Now I kind of want to know how badly we could this up. In my quest to completely disrespect this recipe, I discovered something pretty amazing. Let me explain. When I had a bunch of noodles at once, which is what I tried at a later time, it kind of felt like mush in my mouth. It was chewy and great, but when I was eating it, I couldn't tell the individual strands Here's how the recipe went down. There's three main ingredients that probably affected the texture of the dough. Tapioca starch, rice flour, and rice blended with water. I wanted to see what each of these ingredients did. So I made a dough with only tapioca starch, only rice flour, and without any blended rice. When I tried making this recipe without rice, that didn't really go well. So this one clearly has nothing holding it together. And the rice acted like a glue. Most noodles have gluten to stretch. Gluten is the chewy part in bread and pasta, but in rice noodles, it doesn't have it. So how does it stretch? When rice cooks, something called gelatinization happens. This is when the starch in the rice takes in water, gets bigger, and explodes with gooey gel. This gel is what actually makes rice feel chewy and soft, and it also makes our dough stick together. That is definitely unusable. You need rice. Or, what if I just poured water onto the flour to make this starch gel? As you can see, this is actually pretty stretchy, I compared the new method to the old one and some others. I did not expect this. So these are two opposite sides of the spectrum where this was only tapioca starch and this was only rice flour. If you do want to make it chewier, add more tapioca starch. If you don't like the chewy texture and want more rice flavor, add more rice flour. The control is almost like mushy compared to the no rice one. I actually prefer the no rice method. It's not only easier, but the shape holds a lot better because you can control how much of the gelatin that's inside of the dough. After six hours of experimenting, this one wins. And here's the final noodle recipe. In a bowl, add rice flour, tapioca starch, salt, and then boiling water. Let it sit and cool down for about 10 to 20 minutes. Knead everything together until it becomes a solid piece of dough. Ah! I made a huge mistake. I scaled my recipe up by three times, and then I was like, oh, this looks kind of dry. So I just added regular water. When you mix water and starches together, it gets really, it just falls apart. Look, it's just stretching, and it doesn't hold a form. So what I should have done was add hot water rather than more water. Because when you add hot water, it basically gelatinizes the starches, forming a paste that is stretchy and strong. I wasted like two pounds of flour. I had to buy more. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so stressed because tomorrow I have to cook for everybody. And if this doesn't turn out right, why is it like this? If it's dry, do not add cold water. Add more boiling water. Divide it into equal parts. Flatten it using a pasta maker to your desired thickness. Dust it with some rice flour. Cut the noodles into the shape that you want and then boil it for about three to four minutes until it becomes nice and chewy. If you're not going to use the noodle right away, I recommend drying the raw noodle on a rack for about four to eight hours and then you could store it in a cool, dry place pretty much forever. If you're not up for making noodles from scratch, I still got you. Fresh noodles will cook instantly in boiling water. Dried varieties take around seven to 10 minutes to boil, depending on the brand. The real choice, thin, 
versus wide noodles. Wide noodles offer more chew due to their shape, but soak up less broth. Thin ones may be less chewy, but absorb more broth due to their surface area. So what's your pick? Team wide or team thin? Let me know in the comments. We're finally here. What toppings do we put on pho? Uh, regular onion, uh, so cilantro, green onion, bean sprout, and uh, Thai basil, mint, ngogai, chilies. People like to put lemon in there because it's salty. And you prepare your, uh, your meat you want to buy. Pho is iconic for the raw meat. What's the best meat to top pho with? You know, I use, uh, instead of uh, regular beef, I use filet mignon. Traditionally, I have round is used, but my dad loves filet mignon. These meats are picked for a reason. They're lean. Raw fat, if not cooked long enough, can be chewy. Since meat only briefly gets cooked in boiling water, it doesn't get the prolonged heat needed to properly render. So these are the cuts of meat that you use for thigh or raw meat. I have round, top round, bottom round, beef tenderloin, sirloin tip, top sirloin. For easier slicing, freeze the meat for about 30 minutes beforehand and cut using the full length of a sharp knife. If the pieces are too thick, just pound it down paper thin with a tenderizing hammer or something flat. While the raw meat is iconic, I think it's overhyped. And put not. That's mean the brisket. Remember that brisket that we added? That should be the star. To make it easier to cut, pull it down quickly by placing it in a plastic bag and submerging it in icy water. Then you can cut it paper thin. The most underrated meat of them all? This right here is the best part of pho. Leftover meat and cartilage. Remember all those bones that we strained? Let them cool a bit before taking the meat off with your hands. This has all the flavoring of the broth into the meat. It's like a flavor explosion every time you bite into it. Finally, let's bring it all together. You think Banoi also made it the same way? She never measured yes. anything? Never. We never measure anything. I always felt unworthy of making the dishes that connected me to a place where I'd never even been to. Speaking a language that I never used anywhere else but home. I also always had my grandma who was able to cook for me. But as the years went by, I started to lose that language. A lot, a lot of things that I want to learn from my know to, to cook, but uh, it's gotten forgot now, so forget very bad. I thought it was too late. I think breaking down this dish to its science was a way for me to make up for all the lessons I didn't get to learn from her. And in doing that, I realized I had everything I needed the whole time. <laughs>I was able to figure it out with my dad and learn things even he didn't know. I also got to share the same dish as my grandma made for me in the same way with everybody around her. Mm. It's so good! No matter where she was in the world. Reminds me of home. <laughs> Thank you for cooking with me. Now how do I get this back to my family in America? What else do you want to make?